Hey everybody, I have a video here for you today, and I've had some messages and some comments, questions, so I thought I would talk about this today, and this of course, what you are looking at is the Shroud of Turn, and this is a subject that I have researched by far the most, and I feel the most comfortable with in my knowledge. And when I first started researching the Shroud, it popped up in a when I was researching the Templars, and I knew about the Shroud, I knew general facts about it, but I just assumed it was a medieval hoax. And then I did some research on the Shroud and watched documentaries and realized a fundamental problem with everybody who is researching this relic. Everything you see on the Shroud starts out, is this a medieval hoax or is this indeed the burial cloth of Christ? And that's no way to conduct real research, so I thought I would do it the proper way. And uh, probably three years straight, I've been researching this, and I haven't talked about it for last year uh, much, because the comfortability factor went out the window a long time ago, and especially with what I've found out lately. But uh, what is this? Well, if you say, well, this is Jesus, you know not the surface that you scratch. And if you ask me, is this Jesus? And I answer, yes, I'm not, that's not really the truth. And if you say, is this Jesus? And I go, no, well, that's not really the truth either. It's a very complicated story. Obviously, that's why you have no real answers on the Shroud of Turin. But this has been known by four names, or by four different terms. One, it was called the Image of Edessa. And the reason why I researched this isn't because I believed in it and I wanted to prove it. It's actually because I didn't believe in it and I wanted to disprove it because it's a lot easier to disprove something than prove it. But originally it was called the image of Edessa. And there was an ancient term for it, not made by human hands, is kind of the general term for it. And that's really ironic because when scientists studied it in recent years they are amazed because they could not figure out how it was made it was not painted it was not burned on they still don't know how it was made are they going to find out well i think they might i don't think everything has been taken into consideration but that's a story for another day it was known as the mandelian when it moved to constantinople in 944 now when it is displayed in Turin, Italy, it is known as the Shroud of Turin. That's a very general terminology for it. The image of Edessa is a very general terminology for it. Not made by human hands is a very symbolic term for it. And it's actually in the Bible. This is in the Bible. I'll show you that in a second. But the Mandelian, that tells us a lot more about this holy relic. Now when you read about the etymology for Mandelian, it's clear Manda is a towel or tablecloth or napkin or hand towel, some sort of linen. That's what Manda is. And tablecloth, if you look in the New Testament, what's the original word for tablecloth from heaven? It's actually the emblem of the Bible. Or excuse me, emblem of the Gospel. So the first part of this, manda, obviously means a linen or a cloth. And lion, well, people really don't know where this terminology came from, and there's a lot of guesses. And one is, it is the manda, or the linen, of the lion god of Judah, symbolized in this way, obviously the lion. And here is a saint, and there is a sheep on his lap. This is rich in symbolism, the Lion King of Judah. Or else we have another possibility. Now we have another possibility. It's the Manda, or the linen of Elian, and it is also spelled E-L-I-O-N in some cases, or E-L-I-A-N. So that would be 
the linen of Elian. That is a much more descriptive term, and I like both of those. So just use your imagination. And this right here, the symbolism of the Lion King of Judah, the Manda Lion, would fit this. And who is this? This is St. Julian or Mar Elian. The religion of the Mandilian comes from, obviously, from the first part of the name here, the Mandaeans. And what is what are the Mandaeans all about? Well, the word Mandaean refers back to an ancient term, Manda, or knowledge, or Gnosis, and therefore means Gnostic. And they are also directly connected to the Sabians in the exact part of the world that Sogmatar is located that I talked about a few videos ago. And I just wanted to show you this real quick. This is the ceiling of the Church of Mar Elion. And if you know what Egyptian tombs look like, that is very Egyptian. And if these guys were Parthian Egyptians, Sabians, it makes perfect sense that their church was covered in stars because they were astronomers and that's where the word sabians come from now what does mandai what does maidai or mandai mean and this comes from the haran garawitha and haran that's the exact part of the world that sagmatar comes from and all those ancient spots in turkey present-day turkey i told you about well it says a priest explained the word is persian it means a dwelling the word occurs again in a compound in the word mandalita or mandilita, the name of a curious triple betel erected in the courtyard of a house where a member of the family has died. The meaning here being obviously the dwelling of the spirit. The dwelling of the spirit is the manda, and that is the Gnostic, the dwelling of the spirit. And it's exactly why the rose is a symbol. For the Holy Grail, it's the dwelling of the soul. Now, I will leave some links below, but this, it says here, the translation of image not made by hands, and that was the way it was known. And the Greek word for this, not made by hands, not that's in the New Testament, and anybody knowing anything about the origin or the original text of the Bible would know this. So let's take a look. Now this comes from a book, and I will leave the link below, and this comes from 2 Corinthians. And it says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, and the original Greek term, I'll show you in a second, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we are in this tent, grown, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. And here it is a tent, other places it is a coat, other places it is a robe, other places it is a garment. Let's read on. Using quasi-platonic language, Paul contrasts the frail human body, our earthly house, this tent, with our permanent home, the eternal building from God, a house not made with hands, and a habitation from heaven. Now it says, if the earthly tent house is the mortal human body, the eternal heavenly building from God is undoubtedly the resurrected body in light of the resurrection men mentioned in the immediate context. And so that word not made by human hands, ironically, that is what researchers today say about the shroud. This is the most interesting thing I have ever researched. Seems the dwelling of the soul is the symbolic language used for this item. The dwelling of the soul the resurrected light body not made by human hands something very divine that is what this is described as 
The symbolic language describes it as the dwelling of the soul or the vessel of the soul. Now, the religion of the Shroud, the Mandaeans, well, they have prayers directly related to the man on this holy relic. And shouldn't that be included when you're talking about this holy relic? Here's one of them. The soul in its coat of all colors. And this comes from the Ginza. And where does that come? From ancient Haran, from that part of the world I've talked about. It says, the soul, the soul speaks. Who cast me into the Taibo? The earth. Who cast me into the Taibo? The earth. Who chained me in the wall? Who cast me into the stocks? which matches the fullness of the world. Who threw a chain round me that is without measure? Who clothed me in a coat of all colors and kinds? Well, how do I know that they are talking about the Shroud of Turin? Well, this coat of all the colors, we can go over to one of the earliest Gnostic texts, and he talks about the glorious robe, sparkling with splendid colors, Moreover, at the bottom here, it says, the King of Kings image was depicted entirely all over it. And I believe this, uh, this is the hymn of the robe of glory. This is, this is one of the very earliest things ever written about what we know today as the Shroud of Turin. And this comes from the Gnostic Library. You can read all about the Shroud. They're called the Gnostic Gospels, the Apocryphal Text. The Gospel of Mary Magdalene? Why isn't that in the Bible? Maybe it's because when she's conversing with the Jesus figure, she's conversing, conversing with a vision in a linen. Yeah, the Gnostic Gospels are pretty interesting. They tell you, Nazarene, Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, what does it mean? Nazarene, what does that mean? It means the vision. They tell you all about this in the Gnostic Gospels. Now, the very next prayer coming from the Mandeans is called Wrapped in Sleep. And gee, I wonder what that is referring to. Wrapped in Sleep. Come on, people, let's think here. It says, I am wrapped and sleep in a garment in which there is no defect. And we know that garment has the image of the kings all over it from the previous text. It says, in a garment which there is no defect, which has nothing missing or lacking, the life knew about me, Adam, who slept, awoke. He the helper took me by the palm of my right hand and gave me a palm branch into my hand. The light cast me into the darkness, and the darkness filled with light. On the day when light arises, darkness will return to its place. He approached the clouds of light and his course was set to the place of life. These are the prayers of Man the Mandaeans. This is what I know about the holy relic known as the Shroud of Turin today. Hope you thought this was interesting, and you all have a very nice day.